We don't know if the weather will cooperate. Josh and I had planned to film an Ash Wednesday commemoration tomorrow night. It probably, well, it's undecided. Uh, we'll just have to go from there. But if we're able to, we want to be able to get out an Ash Wednesday commemoration, a virtual online service for you who might want to participate. Uh, you can read in last week's newsletter and the one that will be sent out at least by email this week. But we will ask you, like communion when you gather your own bread and juice, uh, to gather your own uh, representation of the soil of the earth. Um, Ash Wednesday commemorates our mortality, our finitude, in light of the redemptive work of Christ on our behalf, it's the beginning of the season of Lent. So if the ground is not frozen, and it pretty well is, maybe you have plants within your home, but you could take some earth, representative of ashes, and you could mix in a little water and a little olive oil and make your own produce for the imposition of ashes and the sign of a cross on your forehead, or on the forehead of those in your household, you can work that out yourself. I always take some of the palm leaves from former Palm Sunday worship services, and I burn these and make some ash and mix in a little bit of water, a little olive oil, you're welcome to take some of these and burn these yourself at home like I'll be doing and make your own ashes if you'd like to do that and you can get those after the service. Thank you so much for your being here today. Thank you for your faithfulness in supporting the work of God through your church. It's uh, given the reduced attendance in all churches. Uh, I've talked with couple of my colleagues, they've told me that this was a few months ago, that their worship attendance was about 25% of what it had been, and that was before the winter came upon us. So thank you for your faithfulness, uh, not only in being here, but in providing financially for the ongoing work and operation and ministries of your church. You've just been really fabulous in that given given the circumstances and the situation. So we thank you. Well, we'll enjoy Debbie playing a little bit more, and then we'll have an abbreviated message. invite you to listen to Paul's words to the Christian church in Corinth. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, 
if I hand my body over to be burned, I may boast, but if I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in keeping a record of wrongs, but rather rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. Faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest gift is the gift of love. Over the last week or so, I've read a book called Love Does. And in it, the author of this New York Times bestseller, he recounts when he was younger, working for Young Life as a college student. I don't know if you've heard of Young Life. Uh, it's led by college-aged people and others who work with high school students to try to help introduce them to Jesus Christ in a way that's not heavy on the religion part. He said that one day, ten days before Valentine's Day, he was at the front of the group uh, playing his guitar and singing and that this woman named Maria came in to the meeting. She had just finished college and that Young Life group did not have a female college participant so she uh, was willing to do that for that group to be a female there uh, working with the high school students. He said that as soon as he saw her, he stopped playing and he whispered in his friend's ear, named Doug, he said, that's Mrs. Goff. Well, he began uh, putting together a Valentine's Day card for her. And he wanted it to be big. He took pieces of cardboard that were four by eight feet in dimensions, glued them together for the envelope, put a stamp on it the size of a doormat upside down, and then took another sheet or piece of eight by four feet cardboard and wrote, Maria. Will you be my Valentine? And so on Valentine's Day, he goes to where she works in this high-rise office building complex. He can't even get this eight-foot tall thing hardly in the elevator from the garage basement parking. People are on the elevator with him kind of laughing and amused. He gets up to the 12th floor where Maria works Stuck in the elevator, the thing is dinging and people began to gather in that 12th floor office lobby. They're wondering what in the world. He finally gets it out and he's standing there and he asks to see Maria, so they page her. He, hadn't, he just saw this woman for the first time 10 days earlier. She comes around the corner, down from around the hall, down the hall to see what's going on. And he said when she saw it, and all these people that had gathered out of curiosity, that she was absolutely mortified. And he said it set our courtship back at least six months. And that from that time... 
she kept a polite distance from me. Well, he was not going to be deterred. He was undissuaded, as he said. And so he started every day making her a sandwich. He knew where she parked her car and would put it under her windshield wiper. And sometimes he'd put a note in there with it. And he would not give up. He says, when you go after something you love, you'll do anything it takes to get it. Sometimes even at great cost. Sometimes when you go after something you love, it may cost everything. Like God's costly love in pursuing us. He says that in his pursuit of Maria, who later would say yes to him when he first asked her, he couldn't even get it out. He said he got down on one knee and looked her in the eye and said, will you, he was so emotional he couldn't even get it out. She finished the statement for him. She said, yes. He said, God taught me something about what's going on, he said, in the universe. In my pursuit of Maria, how she, I did things to try to get her attention. And it just didn't get through to her. It just wasn't important to her at the time. But he said, I didn't give up. I kept going. And in the same way, he said, God has been pursuing me. In ways that initially I didn't, didn't get my attention. He didn't get through to me. Nevertheless, God wouldn't stop. That's what love does, he says. It pursues without end. Like Paul said in the scripture we wrote, love perseveres, it endures, it never grows tired, it never finishes finding ways to fully express itself. He said that he and Maria loved going to British Columbia and that they even now have bought a house there at the end of an inlet. And he says, we open that house up for people who may need to get away or need to think and reflect or just have time in a setting like that. He says, we get in a boat and we go uh, on this fjord and we look at these rock formations on either side and this mountain that in time blends into a giant glacier he says I think it may be the prettiest place on earth and he says it's been in situations like that in the beauty of nature that God has attempted to woo me to get my attention by some beautiful grandeur of the creation whatever it takes to get through to me and form a relationship with me he pursues me the way that I pursued Maria God in Christ has, has pursued us and wooed us to Him to get our thoughts focused beyond ourselves toward Him, whether we're married or single, 
We don't need to know everything uh, of where we may be going with someone we trust. What we give is a response to God. What's God's will and purpose for your life, for my life? Beyond all, we know that it's that we love Him with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that we love others. That we pursue love above all else. And He says... Bob Goff does that a formula for life is just simply this you take your whole life your loves your passions your interest and put those together with what God wants for you to love him and to love others and you follow God in that pursuit of life that God doesn't purpose for any of us to just be observers or listeners or an audience. God doesn't want us just to think about loving, but to become people who express God's love to others. He says, love does. And I've looked through the New Testament this week, through really every book in the New Testament, and listened to a few things that the New Testament writers tell us about love. That love does. It doesn't just observe, but that we're to be participants. Paul says in the text that we read, putting love at the very center of a congregation's life. That it's absolutely indispensable to the life of faith. And he stresses the self-giving, sacrificial nature of the love to which we're called. That's translated into a form of congregational life that does not insist on its own way that is not self-centered, but self-giving, and reaches beyond ourself to others. That love cannot be held. It can't be realized unless it's being given and shared with others. And not just our spouse, as special as he or she may be, or our significant friends but that God's love that flows into our lives by the Holy Spirit, circulating in and through us, is to be openly shared and given God's love uh, to all the people around us, and that we can grow in love. Paul says, pursue love above all else. Seek spiritual gifts, but... First of all, foremost, seek the gift of love. So we can grow. We can develop as people of love. New Testament writers say, love shows kindness. It demonstrates patience. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love gives like God's love gives. It seeks the well-being of others. Love does extravagant things like the woman in the New Testament that broke a whole container of expensive perfume over the head of Jesus. Love does extravagant things. It provides care, the writers say, for fellow followers of Jesus. Love fulfills the law. 
Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love fulfills the law. Love serves. Love makes us servants of one another. Love does. Love forgives others as God in Christ has forgiven us. Love is lived out in the way that Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Love of husbands for their wives, the New Testament says, is to be like the love of Christ for us who gave himself for us. The New Testament says, clothe yourself with love. And abound in love for each other. And then love encourages. It brings joy. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love casts out fear. Love does. Let everything, Paul says, you do. Be done in love. And then lastly, I'm struck by the call in the New Testament that says, don't just love in word and speech. Love in truth. Love in action. It's so important that Paul says that if we don't do this, if we don't put love above all else, if we don't learn to be loving people with the love of God poured into our hearts and shared with others, then all the rest of it means nothing. And we gain nothing. It's a matter of the heart. And it's a matter of doing. So, we're so fortunate to have that knowledge that it's at the center of the Christian faith. It's the most important thing that we do. It's our highest calling is to love each other. So what do we do with this knowledge? We have it. Well, as Bob Goff states, we're no longer observers. We're not just believers. We're participants. God in Christ wants people to get to the do part of their faith. Not just for the sake of activity, but because He wants our faith to matter to us. To make our faith, to make what we believe, our very own love story. The one you're writing right now. Your love story. The one you're writing right now. In your church, in your home, with your friends, your children, grandchildren, your community. With God who loves you. As I said earlier, loved you before you ever became aware of it. Pursued you. Obviously, got through to you. And you responded. And you continue to respond. And you continue to open your heart to God and His love. To embrace it. And to know that this isn't about laws and things we can't do it or should do it, that at the heart of it is an intimate loving relationship with God and with each other the greatest of gifts and you and I are continuing today to write our own love story as it relates to God and how our faith is expressed through love. Lord God, thank you. Thank you that we're part of your love story. 
your love pursuit of us. Thank you for this loving church, this grace-filled church, these loving people who've gathered here today to worship you, to focus our life toward you, to celebrate love, to be part of a family's expression of their commitment to Christ and to you by bringing another of their children to the altar of God. Lord, in these final moments of this service, here are our expressions of love to you and thankfulness for our place in your heart, in your church, in your kingdom, with each other. Thank you for placing us here with each other, Lord, in the love we have for you and for one another. May it ever deepen and grow. Amen.